The committee will come to order. This hearing is fully virtual, so we need to address a few housekeeping matters. For members, uh, members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. For purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise, uh, the chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition. If I notice when you are recognized that you have not unmuted yourself, I will ask you if you would like the staff to unmute you. If you indicate approval by nodding, staff will unmute your microphone. We will begin with the chair and ranking member. Then members uh, present at the time the hearing is called to order will be recognized in order of seniority. We're using the five minute clock, which you will notice on your screen. It will show how much time is remaining. If there is some technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. Finally, regarding uh, adding extraneous or additional material to the record per house rules, we have set up an email address where members can send anything they wish to submit for the record after seeking recognition for its inclusion. That email address has been provided in advance to your staff. I would like to welcome the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, to present the fiscal year 2022 budget request for the Library of Congress. Dr. Hayden, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for being here. At the beginning of your testimony, please introduce your colleagues who will be joining you today. Many familiar faces. Uh, the mission of the library is to engage, inspire, and inform. Even amid a pandemic, this has not changed. Over the past few years, the library has made significant strides in the areas of modern, modernizing essential technology and optimizing operations to facilitate easier and robust access for Congress and the public. Considering the continuing restrictions of the COVID-19 pandemic, the strategic plan to expand access, enhance services, optimize resources is more important now than ever. Currently, resources for the Library of Congress are a little over 14% of the entire legislative branch budget, totaling 757.4 million in appropriated funds in fiscal year 2021. For fiscal year 2022, the library has requested $801 million, which is a 5.8% increase or $43.7 million over the fiscal year 2021 enacted level. I hope you can expand on the budget justification, descriptions, requests for pro programmatic increases in LCAP and the integrated electronic security system and how these initiatives will position the library to better adapt to rapidly changing needs, ensure the safety of all the collections and the library workforce. I hope you can also address security operations in the cloud and the necessary upgrade to cellular connectivity in the library. The Library of Congress is a treasure of the United States, and it is our duty to protect the valuable collections and preserve the library's ability to chronicle this great nation and provide access to our history for generations to come. I look forward to your testimony today, Dr. Hayden. And at this point, I would like to yield to my colleague and friend from Washington State, a state that produces more potatoes than Idaho, the ranking member, Jamie Herrera Butler, for any opening comments she would like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for that kind introduction. I'd like to welcome Dr. Hayden uh, and, and Director Mazanek. I'm saying that. All right, good. <laughs> and Acting Director Strong here today. Um, as the largest library in the world, the Library of Congress boasts a remarkable collection of literature as well as truly unique items in its collections. These collections range anywhere from the contents of Abraham Lincoln's pocket, the fateful night of his assassination, to a book smaller than the size of a penny. 
an important task for the library is to make your collection uh, of historical documents and human knowledge accessible to every corner of our country, even Hawaii, uh, for Representative Case. Um, although I'm sure you won't mind making it accessible to folks in Hawaii, Dr. Hayden. Um, this is especially important for folks who may not have the opportunity to travel to DC to see firsthand the breadth of the library's collections and resources. And I wanna make sure that my constituents back home in Southwest Washington uh, and citizens across this nation have these resources uh, that the library provides at their fingertips. From the digitization of historical documents to providing resource, rich resources for students and teachers to access online, I like that the library is taking active steps to ensure that those who seek the library's resources have access to them. I look forward to working with you to continue this important mission. The library is also continuing progress on its visitor experience initiative to transform the Thomas Jefferson building to further engage visitors, young and old alike. I'm pleased to see the third installment of the initiative in the budget request and I'm interested uh, to hear an update on the project. And despite the challenges presented with the COVID-19 pandemic, the library has continued its excellent service to Congress while providing education, uh, uh, educators and students valuable learning resources as thousands of schools across the country are forced to transition to online learning. I can, I think I can sp speak for all of us when I say I look forward to the day when the library does physically reopen its doors to welcome the public. Dr. Hayden, your total budget request for the library is $845.9 million for the fiscal 2022, a 5.5% increase from the FY21 enacted. Included in that is $129.6 million for the Congressional Research Service and $98 million for the Copyright Office. The budget includes, includes several IT modernization projects, including updates to legacy systems that manage the entire physical and digital collection, provide fundamental security protection, and connect throughout the entire library's footprint. I'm interested to hear how these initiatives are prioritized. So I appreciate all the work that you and your team do, Dr. Hayden, and I look forward to meeting again in person, hopefully in the near future, and hearing from your testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thanks, Ms. Rivera Butler. Dr. Hayden, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman Ryan, Ranking Member Herrera Butler, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony and support of the library's fiscal 2022 budget. And joining me today, the principal deputy librarian, Mr. Mark Sweeney, the head of the CRS, Mary Mazenick, the new register of copyright, Shira Perlmutter, Karen Kinniger, the head of NLS, and Mr. Bud Barton, our chief information officer. One year ago, when we had to close the library's doors as the pandemic began, we had to open other avenues that allowed us to serve Congress and the American people in new and innovative ways. And thanks to your support for our investments in IT infrastructure, the library's network was able to handle an 800% increase in remote workforce and essential services, including CRS and the United States Copyright Office were able to maintain full productivity while we're working remotely. In light of the challenges presented by COVID-19, the library has transformed our public outreach by pivoting to virtual events and have developed new audiences for the library beyond those who could have visited us in person. And with congressional support and private philanthropy, we remained on schedule to unveil the library's new visitor experience in phases beginning in late calendar 2022. Worthy of special note is the National Library for the Blind and Print Disabled, NLS, which utilized its network of state and local libraries to circulate more than 20 million copies of Braille, audio, and large print items to patrons. I'd like to recognize NLS Director Karen Kenninger, who joined the library in 2012 and will retire at the end of May. At the outset, her priorities for NLS leveraged advancing technology and expanded content for all print disabled persons. Karen accomplished all of her goals and so much more for the NLS. I would like to express my sincere gratitude for your support in the fiscal 2021 funding bill for high 
priority needs, such as cybersecurity enhancements, state-of-the-art shelving for the law library, and enhanced science and technology research capacity in CRS. Thank you as well for your continued support for the library's new preservation strategy and collection storage modules at Fort Meade as part of the architect of the Capitol's budget. I come before you today to discuss the Library of Congress's fiscal 2022 appropriations request for approximately 846 million, a 5.5% increase over the library's 2021 enacted appropriation. This request includes 24.2 million in mandatory pay and price level increases. The balance of the increase represents critical program investments necessary to fulfill the library's role, continue modernization efforts, and ensure the safety and security of the library's collections and workforce. The budget request seeks to modernize and replace the legacy integrated library system that was installed in 1999 in preparation for Y2K and is now at the end of its life. Just as smartphones of that era are now obsolete in our current mobile world, ILS no longer meets the library's needs for collections management. The replacement will be a modern library collections access platform that will be the heart of the library's collections management, physical and digital for the next generation. We are requesting funding to take the next step in modernizing and optimizing financial management and planning in the library. We seek to stabilize our current accounting activities and establish a new enterprise planning and management program. Our pandemic operations, as well as heightened physical security threats, have focused attention on the safety and security of our workforce and collections. We are requesting funding to modernize the library's nearly 20-year-old integrated electronic security system used by both the library and the U.S. Capitol Police for physical security monitoring of library facilities and collections. We are asking for funding to replace the library's end-of-life 3G cellular system that provides connectivity for only about 50% of the library and presents security issues. We are also requesting funding to allow the library to implement the same advanced level of IT security across both its data centers and cloud hosting environments. I'd like to note that these two requests are important life safety and security improvements for library facilities and would be good candidates for any additional fiscal 2021 funding the committee might consider as well. In addition, to support library employees with work anywhere, anytime functionality and advanced virtual collaboration tools, we are requesting funding to speed the transition to Microsoft 365 in alignment with congressional adoption of the same. And finally, I am delighted to have with us today Cheryl Perlmutter, the new Register of Copyrights. This budget requests funding to fully implement the Copyright Alternative in Small Claims Enforcement or CASE Act with the creation of a small claims court within the Copyright Office. In closing, the Library's 2022 Congressional Budget Justification continues a sequence of strategically planned modernization efforts across the enterprise, supports the security of our vast collections, and enhances the safety of our workforce and visitors. Chairman Ryan, Ranking Member Herrera Butler, and members of the subcommittee, thank you again for supporting the Library of Congress and for your consideration of our fiscal 22 request. And I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Hayden. Appreciate that. We are going to start the questioning with the gentlelady from Washington State, Ms. Herrera Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was holding my breath on that one. <laughs> uh, um, Dr. Hayden, in your budget justification, the library introduces three new requests for fiscal year 2022 that all involve critical modernization into its legacy systems uh, with associated costs of over $15 million. Uh, did question number one is did the COVID pandemic or the January 6th assault uh, on the Capitol play a role in identifying the need to upgrade these legacy systems? And if appropriated, the funds to upgrade these systems, what is the time frame that you foresee each of them being completed? The request for 
the two security systems were actually already very important to the library's security in general and were especially important with recent events. For instance, the security cameras that need to be replaced, that legacy system, the cellular system uh, that is no longer supported. All of these uh, items were already part of what the library needed to have. And with consultation with the uh, Capitol Police uh, and during recent events, we were assured that our efforts and what we had proposed for security in these two systems would greatly aid in the general security of the Capitol and would be very much supported by the um, Capitol Police. And so in looking at when we would be able to, and I'm going to put on my glasses, uh, to make sure that I give you the correct information. Um, the system, the Integrated Electronic Security System, the IESS, were, as I mentioned, already involved with our security update. And so with the IESS, we will be able to have two physical security specialists and the work to replace the obsolete hardware is scheduled to be completed during and within fiscal 22. The enhanced cellular network, the implementation will take place over two years and will be completed after fiscal 2023. I just want to also add that the LCAP, the library system, that is also going to be included with um, a modernization will be complete after two years. All right. Um, yeah, I'm still on. Uh, thank you. And I wanted to ask um, if, so the committee, basically on public access, I'm sorry, I was trying to check my time. Uh, at the committee's encouragement, the library, you convened your first public meeting to discuss public input into the library's legis legislative information services. Um, and I was just curious if you've submitted that report, uh, evaluating the requ requests made by the public at that meeting. Um, and when's your next meeting scheduled? Or are, you, or are you planning to keep having these? Really planning to have meetings. The report was submitted uh, this past January. And we have several recommendations that are being considered. And we also hosted a, um, a series of other smaller forums. And so we plan to have continue those types of public input. We received a lot of good information and we have groups that are working on uh, looking at how we could implement some of the suggestions. We had about 300 people participating in that forum that was held in September of 2020. And the feedback has, and I have the report with me, there are several things that uh, we think will be able, the ideas and suggestions that are in development. For instance, things like helping uh, the public, more documentation to help the public with the legislative information, uh, consolidated digests of email alerts, all of these types of things are suggestions that a group is working on and we hope to be able to be able to put some of the suggestions into action. All right, thank you. And with that, I will yield back to the gentleman from Ohio, the state where Jerry Springer was actually a mayor before he went to TV. <laughs> With that, I yield back. Very good, Judge Jerry. Uh, Ms. Wexton. Thanks so much, Mr. Chairman. And that's a, that's a good reminder. I had forgotten that Jerry Springer was actually a mayor in Ohio. It's shots fired, so I don't know what you're gonna come up with to deal with that. But thank you guys so much for joining us today, Dr. Hayden and all the witnesses. Um, I, I wanna direct my questions to you, Ms. Mazanik, because 
I love CRS so much. Um, not a, not a week goes by that I don't I don't use some of your resources. To, you know, I, I was I was appointed to the state and foreign ops subcommittee, and I understand that there's something called the International Development Finance Corporation, which cre was created under the Build Act. I didn't know anything about it, but thankfully, CRS had a memo, so I just got I just got this yesterday. So it's it's so wonderful. I love you guys. The work you do is fantastic. And I'm delighted to hear that, I, although everybody's been on full-time telework since basically March of 2020, um, you've been even more productive during that time. And you've, you've enhanced your relationships and engagement with Congress and product productivity has increased. So I think some of that is probably that in this remote environment, congressional staff are more able to, to uh, reach out to and attend some of the programs. But I know a lot of it has just been the really heroic efforts of, of your of your workforce. So I want to commend you on, on that. Now, do you have a long-term plan to enable CRS employees to continue working to working remotely, given how productive they are? Thank you very much for your very kind comments. Um, we have not made any decisions at this point because we're in the middle of the pandemic, which is still evolving. So I don't, I can't really say with certainty where we'll end up with uh, our telework. It is uh, currently um, the, the side article to our, our, our CBA, our, our bargaining agreement has been opened by our union and uh, we are in discussions on, on telework. Um, while we, would be, we have been very productive during uh, the pandemic in a virtual environment, there have been some things that we haven't been able to do, such as in-person briefings, in-person seminars, and uh, confidential consultations. So I don't know exactly where the balance will be when we get through this situation. Um, hopefully, you know, hopefully you guys will find a happy medium in there somewhere. So, and it um, also it also depends on uh, the expectations that Congress has for us. And okay. Uh, and how uh, uh, the availability uh, they expect from us. Great. Now, what additional supports are you providing to employees who are working at home remotely? Are you, are you giving them extra things like dual monitors or other equipment or, or what, are, what kind of supports are you providing? So uh, we haven't uh, been able to do that uh, because um, there definitely requires additional resources to uh, equip home offices with dual monitors, et cetera. Uh, we are working with uh, uh, Bud Barton and our um, OCIO uh, to um, to really uh, see how best that uh, how best we can facilitate uh, telework. Okay. Now, I was also pleased to see that your diversity and inclusion working group met throughout 2020 and discussed outreach strategies and and improving the diversity of the applicant pool. Is this a, um, is this working group, group a permanent one? Well, it, uh, it's right now it is um, a, a permanent in the sense that as long as we have uh, challenges on, on uh, the diversity and inclusion uh, front, or as long as there's uh, work to be done there, I'd like to have uh, the diversity and inclusion working group uh, stay in existence. We are working uh, with the Library of Congress. They also have a diversity and inclusion working group that we actively participate in. Having a diverse uh, professional workforce and an inclusive environment is a top priority, priority for me. And we have taken measures to try to increase diversity in our applicant pools. And you've already mentioned one. Uh, we've expanded our outreach to uh, professional societies and colleges and, and universities that represent underrepresented populations in our work. and places like that, I would imagine, right? So that's great. Now, um, I would like to touch base, to touch talk a little bit about some data that I that was shared with me by your employees association about the demographic of makeup of employees at CRS. And I was alarmed to see that while women make up a greater share of the CRS workforce, they tend to be higher at lower grades than men. And that, that leaves them at a, at a lower step level and everything as they proceed throughout their careers. Do you have any, any insights on why that might be? 
Um, um, I don't have um, uh, anything specific, but I can tell you at the most senior grade, at the senior level, um, level uh, women make up roughly about 43, 45% of senior level um, staff. And, and that percentage actually has been increasing. Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, but I think that you might need to look at that, those disparities at the, at the, when they're at the hiring stage. Because as I said, that's something that's going to follow them throughout their careers and leave them with with less earnings and less retirement and everything. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Amade. I believe is next, but he may have stepped out. All right, Mr. Newhouse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just so you know, you're likely to invoke the wrath of the Idaho delegation onto this committee, but uh, I'll accept that risk because you're, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, Dr. Hayden, welcome to the committee. Thank you very much for sharing uh, some time with us today. And also, I just want to thank you for reaching out. I'm assuming you reached out to all members, and unless it was just me especially, I appreciate that, but uh, last week to prepare for... Uh, uh, for this hearing today so that we had a, a time to visit. And I appreciate that a lot. And I also want to thank uh, all of your colleagues that are with you today. Uh, just like uh, Congresswoman Wexton, I really do appreciate the work of the CRS, invaluable uh, to members of Congress as a resource. Um, <clears throat> as far as the your budget request, Dr. Hayden, um, I, I think I read that you welcome something uh, over half a million visitors um, last year prior to closing mid-March. And I, I just wanted to ask, what's typical for the library? Um, uh, how many people uh, do, you, do you see over a typical year? And with that in mind, kind of along the lines that we were talking about last week, were you able to re realize any cost savings uh, because of the decrease in the number of visitors last year. And show me where that would be reflected in your budget uh, or your budget request for 2021. And then uh, related to that, uh, and I should know the answer to this question, but I'll, I'll expose my ignorance and ask you, was the library um, the recipient of any relief funds, coronavirus relief funds? Yes, yeah. the library was. And last uh, year, the library welcomed, it was a banner year, actually, almost um, 2 million visitors. And that included people who were coming uh, from the Capitol Visitor Center. And that's last where year. quite a few groups, uh, yeah, quite a few uh, tour groups and things like that. That was before uh, the pandemic, the library closed its doors to the public in mid-March, right. uh, almost a year ago uh, this week. And so when the closures happened, the library also had to pivot quite a bit. And we have absorbed about 18.8 .8 million in COVID-related costs. We executed um, the enacted budget with no furloughs of staff and 65% of the library's budget is pay. And for CRS, for instance, 90% of the budget is pay. And we worked in a fully telework, high posture and major projects were able to be continued public events, even though they were closed in person. We did a lot of virtual programming. And so there were things like travel accounts that were under executed, but were realigned to contribute to, to the COVID related costs. And those costs included deployment of technology and also additional sanitation and other related things like supplies uh, for staff members. So as some staff members came back on site, we're in phases 
of operation of a three phased uh, plan before the recent security um, closure that restricted even more our on site uh, activities. That aspect of still being responsible for the safety of staff members and contractors who were allowed to come in contributed to additional maintenance costs. So you said over 2 million vis visitors last year? 1.89. Really? Oh. <laughs> Almost two. We, uh, yeah. And that. Um, That's virtual visitors, maybe. Or I, I don't know. No, I'm talking about the in person. I thought really? uh, what I was trying to clarify when you were saying that um, about 500. Thousand people physically came into the library's yeah. facilities before March when right. the doors closed to the public. Okay. The time period before that, if we were looking, we were on track uh, actually to at least have the same number of in person visitors if the year had been completed. I see. You were anticipating that, that. okay. So, so there's looking, we were looking forward to it. We had special exhibits that had opened, the Rosa Parks exhibit, uh, women's suffrage. We had a number of concerts. There were a lot of activities that were going in there. We're actually sure, sure. bringing in people physically. So there's, um, so that tells me, I guess, that they're other than travel and some other things, and I hate to be nitpicky, but the visitors themselves are re not really a cost center or a, a, a big well, part of the, the expense of the library. I'm just trying to understand. They are. They right. Are? Oh. Well, they, when you say big, um, the number I mentioned, for instance, we did not furlough any staff members. So that expense, that appropriation and being fully executed Right. still happen that's 65 percent of the budget right, right. there okay. so that that didn't go away in fact we were able to um reduce the number of staff members as time went on we like everyone else didn't know how long uh, we would be in this posture so at first there were some administrative leave costs and then over time we were able to uh, reduce those and then so you did, the, did receive some relief funds coronavirus yes relief. and those went into recouping and trying to uh, and how much was that sure just approximately um in terms of what we received yeah i'd have to get back to you on the exact number of all of the CARES Act funding. Okay, I appreciate that. And uh, uh, again, just trying to understand the, the full impact of the, of the closing and uh, uh, where the costs are and as it relates to the budget request. So I appreciate very much your, uh, the information you provide. And like I said, I did appreciate your coming and meeting or virtually meeting with me last, last week too. That helped help me understand much better. And I just turned to some of the uh, additional costs. For instance, our vendors, we were able to uh, pay some of the vendors under appropriated uh, funding because of some of the work that had to uh, cease when vendors and uh, contractors couldn't get on site. So we used the, some of the funding for that. I see. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Mr. Chairman, and I'll, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Amade. Mark. He's not on. Is it? I want to like tap him on the shoulder. Yeah, Mark. He's, he's sitting right there. And the staff text him or his staff and I'll text him, sure. Sorry for the delay here, Dr. Hayden. Hey, Mr. Chairman. 
Sorry to inconvenience the market. It's your turn, buddy. <laughs> as as always, you're a gentleman, and I appreciate you worrying about me. Um, Dr. Hayden said in her testimony she can't wait until Congressman Amade asked questions, so we wanted to get right to you. Well, we'd, we'd worked with her on making sure she had that down, so I'm glad that all went smoothly except for the part where I was supposed to say something. Hey, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and, uh, and Dr. Hayden. I appreciate it. I, I have one area that we had talked about briefly, which was the, the yeah. de acidification thing, and I would like to circle back with you offline, but my question revolves around, I get there's expense to put uh, part of your collection through the deacidification process. I think I understand that um, that process, once, it, once done, takes care of the issue, at least based on present technology, for about uh, a half a millennium or more, um, and, and that if we do the refrigeration thing, um, that basically takes care of the issue, but but I'm looking for doctor to have a little bigger discussion with you in terms of okay. So does that mean we refrigerate? And listen, if refrigerate isn't the right word, then obviously I, I won't blame that on the chairman. That's my fault. Um, but anyhow, I, I'm just kind of looking for cost benefit in terms of refrigeration in perpetuity, um, or, or we can even shorten that up to half a millennium or whatever. And, and then also, I'm curious to if we're doing refrigeration, if there's personnel associated with that, is that refrigeration personnel, or do we still have to, to devote resources to staffing the refrigeration process? So I, I know there's two or three things in there, and I'm mindful of the committee's time and the clock, which is uh, which is running. Um, so I, I'm just going to say I'm going to circle back with you here. Maybe sometime next week we can do it on the phone or something, but I want a better understanding of exactly what the cost benefit specifics are in those two areas. Well, I'm really pleased that you um, asked about the library's preservation strategies, and it's critical that we have flexibility to meet uh, current needs and future needs that will undoubtedly include digital uh, preservation and conservation. So this opportunity to rebalance our preservation strategy has been very important and we appreciate the committee's uh, support. Uh, the specific program, Mass Deacidification, was initiated about 20 years ago. And 10 years ago, our principal deputy librarian, Mark Sweeney, was involved in the preservation strategy, rebalancing at that point, looking to the future, and he can give you even more specifics about that particular aspect, cold storage. Mark? Thank you for the question. Um, you know, we, we look at the brittle uh, or acidic problem in our collections as really a late 20th century problem. And now here we are in the 21st century and our, our one of our biggest collection strategy challenges is dealing with growing digital collections. So we look for efficiencies in how we can deal with uh, the 20th century problem while we rebalance and we use resources, you know, to deal with the digital um, collections that are growing exponentially right now. Cold storage um, slows down a chemical process just as deacidification can slow down a chemical process. Um, the thing you need to understand about the storage is, is that the library's storage capacity needs to grow just as its collections grow. But when we construct that additional storage, um, meeting certain environmental um, qualities, it alleviates the reason to make the investment in the deacidification treatment in the first place. So as an example, it costs about $30 a volume to, de to deacidify a book. Um, we can so if you're if you're if you have two and a half million items in your collection and you want to deacidify all of them that'll cost you about 75 million dollars in chemical treatment for more or less that same cost we can build um, an environmental storage module at fort mead that provides an environment that will secure the material for about the same uh, length of time um, 
for $32 million, but it can, ha it can house 4 million items. So we get a 3.2% uh, increase in the amount of material that we can address by controlling the environment over doing a chemical process. And yes, these facilities that we will build are necessary for the growth of our collections, but if we do it in a smart way with the architect of the capital, we actually lower our treatment costs. I appreciate that. So I'll look forward to our conversation, which takes us down a little bit more since I'm out of time, but uh, that takes us down a little bit more. And, and what are the assumptions? Um, is, is it powered by electricity? You know, blah, blah, blah. Because when you're talking 500 to 1,000 years in the future, um, you're talking 500 to 1,000 years in the future. And I'll just kind of let that lay. We'll look forward to talking with you. Um, Next week. Thank you guys very much, Mr. Chairman. Yes, thank you. I yield back. So, Mr. Amade, um, Dr. Hayden, I've only got a couple minutes here because they have votes and I, I'm down to the wire, but I did want you to talk a little bit more about the visitor's experience. Uh, I know we talked a little bit about it on the phone, but I would love for the American people in this committee to, to hear where we are with that and uh, the support you're getting and the private support that you're getting for it. If you could talk for a couple minutes about that, that'd be tremendous. I really appreciate the support in this unique public-private partnership to create in the iconic Thomas Jefferson building for the first time an orientation center and space for people to learn about what the Library of Congress is, how it served Congress and the American people, and also what it can do for them now. A treasures gallery, for the first time that can have rotating treasures from the world's largest library and to engage people in different ways. And in terms of engagement, a learning lab, a youth center for the young and the young at heart. And so the project has remained on track and on budget, even with the pandemic and with the uh, combined efforts, everything is on track to start with fabrication of exhibits and areas. Uh, we will have more private support coming in and we have submitted proposals to new donors totaling about $15 million uh, and that's in excess of the 20 million that um, we have pledged to have from the private sector to support the effort and Mr. David Rubenstein is leading that effort, and we also have been able to increase our efforts with fundraising in general. We just received a groundbreaking uh, grant to reach out to underserved communities from the Mellon Foundation and also $10 million from the Kislak Foundation for a revamping of their exhibit area on early American history. And so the project is uh, really taking shape and we hope to be able to present to this subcommittee drawings and renderings of the different spaces within the next few months. That's great, that's great. I love the idea of the, uh, the treasurer's gallery. I think that's gonna be a really uh, neat uh, a component and uh, Mention the Gershwin Awards. What's the plan for the Gershwin? That's always one of the great nights in Washington. Uh, and one Garth, of Garth Brooks. Garth last Brooks. Year and, yeah, it's tremendous. So how? Uh, what's, the, what's the plan for that for the coming year? Actually, a year ago um, tomorrow uh, would have been the um, Garth Brooks concert. Um, we are working with our broadcast partners for the virtual. Uh, aspect of a Gershwin Award of Greatest Hits. Uh, we've had everyone from Paul McCartney to Stevie Wonder to Tony Bennett in the past. So there's going to be uh, a way that we can let people know about the Gershwin Award. And we're working with a, a potential uh, honorees uh, to see if possibly by uh, within another year that we could have some component of a live concert. That would be that would be very exciting. 
Um, Very real quick before before I run out of time, we got to run. Um, Dr. Hayden, mention um, the uh, efforts uh, with the Veterans History Project, which uh -huh. is one of my favorites that you run uh, through COVID-19. How have you been able to navigate uh -huh. the complexities of the, the COVID with the, with the Veterans History Project? The Veterans History Project, we were able to, and that's one of our signature uh, outreach programs, over 100,000 oral histories to date from veterans and different uh, engagements. And so the Veterans History staff were able to have, for instance, virtual panel discussions on how to cope uh, with featuring veterans and also veterans as small business entrepreneurs. They had a special music program for the 20th anniversary this year. And also they had a special program and this one in particular uh, was very significant. Veterans, the role of veterans in farming in urban and more rural settings and how it relates to PTSD. Because as we know, veterans uh, know a few things about overcoming adversity. And so to be able to capture their experiences and to have them talk about them virtually, uh, that was wonderful. And so they also were able, the staff of the Veterans History Project were able to give workshops to local communities on how to do virtual programming with veterans. And so about well, 65 members have already taken advantage of the Veterans History Project. And as you know, we, we reach out to all the offices and we want to, to make sure that each state has a significant number of veterans who contribute. Yeah, love it, love it, love it. Well, Dr. Hayden, thank you so much. Uh, you're the best, we appreciate your team. Thank you so much for, for all that you're doing and we look forward to uh, supporting you and your efforts here in the coming budget. Um, we're gonna do the best we can for you, but you've got some really exciting uh, projects uh, going and, uh, you know, as you mentioned about the, the telework and the investments that we make into you have paid off. Yes. Uh, and, you know, we just can't wait to get the, uh, the visitors, uh, the treasurer's gallery and, uh, and the other uh, projects that we have uh, going for you that are, that are going to be uh, super exciting for everybody. And I think, you know, in the coming years, People are going to appreciate more getting out of their homes and getting being able to travel and uh, the visitors experience will be here for them when they get here, hopefully. So we appreciate all you're doing and uh, thank the committee. And uh, with that, we are going to end this committee and we will adjourn. Thank you. Thank you.